comparison between the two, between my position as a writer in America and my position as a writer in France. I'd be very happy to discuss that. The uh, position which writers such as myself hold in America are, those positions are a very lowly. Uh, science fiction is considered to be something for adolescents, for just um, high school kids, and for disturbed people in general to read in America. And the publishers will buy a novel which must meet rigid moral standards, the standards which librarians have, which has to do with sex and violence and so forth. So we are limited in our writing to books which have no sex, no violence, and no deep ideas. Just something of an adventure kind of nature, what we call space opera, which is just westerns set in the future. And this is a strong pressure on us. Uh, the field, science fiction, is just a genre there, uh, ranked in, uh, at the level of nurse romance publications. We, we are considered at the bottom rung. Now, it's not as bad today as it was a few years ago, because recently the academic community has discovered us, and there are scholarly articles being written in America about science fiction, and also science fiction novels are being used in courses at universities and high schools and colleges. Uh, in fact, one of my novels is used even in a course in the modern novel, not just in, as a science fiction novel, but as an example of the modern novel. But that's rare. And um, the general attitude is still highly prejudicial in America. Now, I started out as a pulp writer doing stories for pulp magazines, and I never imagined myself to have any importance. So I was not dismayed by this attitude. I just took it for granted. I had been a clerk in a store, and I was used to having people yell at me and tell me what to do. And so to find myself a writer and to yell at and told what to do did not surprise me. But then I discovered that in Europe, especially in France, science fiction was taken seriously. And the science fiction writer was not regarded as something on the level of a janitor. And my delight was enormous. And my amazement was enormous. And my agent was quite pleased. And uh, I began to meet people from France who would come over and visit me. Uh, a gentleman who was doing his dissertation on a novel of mine came to visit me. And I was, I was simply amazed. I could not imagine anyone taking science fiction seriously. Now, as far as my own work went, I had written what I considered to be serious novels, but they never received any great popularity in America. The largest number of sales of any novel of mine was Solar Lottery, which sold something over 300,000 copies. Uh, Man in the High Castle, which I won the Hugo Award for, for, sold almost, well, by now it sold over 300,000 copies. But by and large, the average American science fiction novel sells about 40 to 50,000 copies, which in a country the size of the United States is a very small portion of the reading public. Now, there are exceptions, of course, like the Andromeda strain, which become bestsellers. But these always are highly promoted by the publisher and usually involve very simplistic ideas, such as a disease from outer space. Ideas that are archaic, they're no longer really uh, interesting ideas. They're, they're something that H.G. Wells either wrote about or could have written about. And I would say that the greatest stimulus to me as a serious writer has been the French reaction to my writing, which began somewhere between 1964 and 1968. It was in 1964 that Editions Opta first approached me and stated that they wanted to publish all of my work, was what they said. 
and uh, from their correspondence, I could tell that they had a quite different attitude toward my writing and toward science fiction in general. So I was stimulated to do a much more serious type of novel, just knowing that eventually it would receive a more serious audience. But in America, it was common, for instance, I remember when I purchased my first published story, uh, somebody said to me, do you read that kind of stuff? And I said, Madam, I not only read it, I write it. And people would say to me, well, why don't you write something serious? Why do you write science fiction? Write something serious. By that, they meant important. Nevertheless, I did as, as well as I could. I wrote the, the most profound, the most imaginative novel I could and just floated it out into the world and hoped that eventually it would receive an audience. But there is a considerable difference between the French interest in science fiction and the American interest. And I, I appreciate the French interest enormously. In fact, it would be impossible for me to have continued my career without the help that the French public has given me, both financially and spiritually. There is a major flaw in America which does not appear to exist in France. And that is the American people are basically anti-intellectual. They're not interested in novels of idea. And science fiction is essentially a field of ideas. And the anti-intellectualism of America and Americans prohibits their interest in imaginative ideas, in intellectual concepts. But there's another facet as regards my particular work say compared to other science fiction writers. I grew up in Berkeley and my education was not limited at all to reading other science fiction novels preceding my own, such as Van Vogt or Heinlein or you know people of that kind, Paget and so on, Bradbury. What I read, because it's a university city, was Flaubert, Stendhal, Balzac, Proust, and the Russian novelists influenced by the French, people like Turgenev, and I even read Japanese novels, modern Japanese novels, uh, novelists who were influenced by the French realistic writers. And I think one reason that I've been popular in France is because the slice of life realistic novel that I write is, is essentially based on the, the uh, 19th century French realistic novels. For instance, if I were to name my favorite novels, I would name Madame Bovary and, and Stendhal's The Red and the Black. Those would be my two favorite novels, or Tegania's Fathers and Sons. And in a sense, I was learning about the novel not from English prose models, but from French prose models. So it makes sense, perhaps, that my writing would be uh, well received in France. A novel of mine such as The Simulacra, for example, which contains maybe 15 to 16 major characters, is definitely derived from uh, such uh, French writers as Balzac. I think this applies more to me than to other uh, American science fiction writers. In fact, I think that it's a great flaw in American science fiction writers and their readers that they are insulated from the great literature of the world, Russian novels, French novels, English novels, and the great American novels. Uh, in other words, it's a closed loop. An American science fiction writer is usually someone who has been a science fiction fan and has read only science fiction novels. So, or, and so when he goes to write science fiction, he bases it solely on prior science fiction. But because I was fortunate enough to live in Berkeley, which is probably as much an intellectual center as you'd find anywhere in the world, uh, I was not limited as my other friends who write science fiction are. Oh yes, of course.
I, 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 I,
we never found out who did it. My attorney said it was the government. There was no doubt that it was the government. But what they were looking for, I don't know. What they thought I was doing, I don't know. I don't even know if it was the government. But um, there were many such illegal entries, and uh, an experience like that tends to make you very paranoid, you know, that you are suspected of some crime. Uh, but like in Kafka's The Trial, <laughs> they never told me what it was I had done. They just told me I was a crusader and they didn't have any need for crusaders. And uh, the fact that I was an intellectual and a writer only made me more suspicious in their eyes. You've got to take into account that in the United States, to be an intellectual, to be a writer, is to wear a sign on your back saying, I am an enemy of the state. I mean, it is something that is hard to understand, I think. There is such an anti-intellectual attitude in America. It's incredible, the suspicion that the authorities have of what they used to call eggheads. Well, they used to call intellectuals eggheads. Uh, it was a term of derision. And the term originated in Nazi Germany. Most people don't know this. I, I happen to know this because I did a lot of research into Nazi Germany for my novel, Man in the High Castle. The term egghead was used by the, by the uh, Sturm of Thailand SA. It referred to the fact that when they beat up people uh, who were defenseless, their skulls cracked so readily against the pavement that the term egghead was evolved by the Sturm of Thailand, and that term was carried over into the United States without any knowledge of its origin. However, the fact that that is the origin of the term egghead, which is the term used for American intellectuals, that origin tells a great deal about the kind of people who would use such a term. of apprehension abruptly in 1974 when the Nixon administration ceased to exist. Uh, I doubt if the paranoia was irrational considering the government that, this, that the United States had. Uh, had, it been, had my paranoia been irrational, it probably would have persisted after the Nixon government was deposed. But in March of 1974, the government's program of spying on dissident anti-war intellectuals, the so-called COINTELPRO, was abandoned. And in March of 74, my so-called paranoia disappeared completely. I felt a lifting of the oppression, the, the sense that there was a watching police agency which was monitoring our activities. I felt that sense lift in March of 74, and has never returned, and it was in March of 74 that the CIA's Operation Chaos, which was to harass, disrupt, and keep surveillance on American dissidents, was officially abandoned. So the kind of paranoia which Michael DeMuth noted, which was real, was based on the fact that uh, we were harassed, we were uh, under surveillance, we really were. There was no doubt about it whatsoever. I've seen my CIA file, I've seen my FBI file under the American Freedom of Information Act. I was uh, legally allowed to see both files. The CIA opened my mail, the FBI had a file on me. I've seen both. Uh, I no longer have this sense of the police activity. Uh, 
It depends a little on what you mean by paranoia. If you mean a psychotic conviction that you were being persecuted, which is not in accord with reality, I don't think I had that. But boy, I sure thought the cops were watching everything I did. And I was correct. I was tipped off by the criminal underground that my house was being watched. The license plate numbers of every car that stopped in front of my house was taken. And uh, these were not part of my imagination. These were actual events. Anyone who visited me, their license plate number was written down by the people next door. Uh, and I was told that the house was being watched and that eventually my house would be hit, my files would be opened, my papers would be taken, and so it came to pass. Uh, as I said in the Rolling Stone article on me, when I came home and found my house consisting of nothing but rubble, ruins, chaos, broken windows, smashed doorknobs, blown open files, I said, thank God I'm not crazy. <laughs> I have real enemies. It's a tremendous relief to discover that somebody really is after me.